Well, everything has been moving up to this moment in the uh, Galatians letter until we get to this great phrase, for freedom Christ has set us free. That is the greatest line ever delivered. And when you hear it now, you'll begin to understand what Paul is getting at. You have been set free, free from sin, free from death, free from the devil, free from wrath, and even free from the beautiful, precious, divine, godly law. How free? I was born a slave, and now I'm free. Christ Jesus shined his light on me. But now, we say, great, what do I use the freedom for? Why was I set free, Paul? Paul says, for freedom. What do I do with my freedom? Be free. No, 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 I mean, how do I live freely? What is my goal in life? Freedom. Where is this freedom? Right here. You've arrived. You're in Freetown, Graceland, Hesed County. You've made it. Freedom is for freedom. That's it. Period. End of sentence. All over. You cannot add a plus to freedom. But get ready, Paul says. There is a storm cloud coming. And now the question is, what do I do? Stand firm, he says. This is the next phrase, stand firm. And now you understand that Luther stole it from Paul. What we've got right up there is from Luther, of course, but it is precisely this verse in Paul. Stand, stand firm. Stand where you are. Go nowhere. Do nothing. There's a battle brewing around you. Freedom haters are circling like hyenas. They're circling all around you. And you say, well, who hates freedom? Subjectors hate freedom. Dominators hate freedom. Controllers hate freedom. Authorities hate freedom. Politicians hate freedom. Friends hate freedom. Family hates freedom. Moses hates freedom. Maybe even mom. But especially... Your own belly button does not like freedom. And you're going to start talking to yourself from your navel. This is no good. And as Paul says, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Haters of freedom have only one strategy. It's all they know. And they use it repeatedly. That is to subject you again to the yoke that was once upon you. They want you to put it back on. They say, great, You're free, but let's not go wild. This is a trick. They say, you are free up to a point, but you need direction. You need a little law and order. You need a little yoke. Suddenly, a free donkey becomes a servile donkey again. The ox gets yoked. Remember, Paul is talking to Galatians here. And Galatians are not only Gentiles, they're Irish. Worse, they're uh, Scotch-Irish. This is the Ozarks before the Ozarks. This is the Ozarks of Turkey. When Paul came in, this is what he saw, people sitting up on their porch with a banjo and a shotgun and white lightning, and he said, oh, Lord, is this it? Uh, Go get them, Paul. That's who I want right there. And so Paul says, wow, Galatians, did you forget what I said to you? And now Paul uh, brings back what it means to have false preachers come in after you. When Luther's working with this, he says, this is the way it is for all of you preachers. You go out and you preach. You create a church. Then the minute you leave, in come the false preachers. The fake preachers come right behind and everything you built is ruined overnight. Paul says, the fake preachers preachers came in. And when they came in, they said to the Gentiles, let's get a Moel for a Brit Mila. Then we can clean these Gentiles up and make them right. Verse 2 says, mark my words, I, Paul, say to you, when you accept circumcision, Christ immediately became worthless to you. What's wrong with a little scissors action? 
What's wrong with a little snip, snip? Jesus got it. Moses took it. It took him quite a while to get there, but Moses finally got it. Uh, it, was, it made Abraham into a symbolic child of Abraham. Uh, it makes uh, Abraham into a symbolic man of faith, but the faith was given before the circumcision. And Paul got, now makes this clear in Galatians. It is not the circumcision in which Abraham's faith rests. Instead now, this circumcision is not going to make you a child of Abraham either. This has to be done in a completely different way. And nevertheless, the fake preachers came in and said, we could make you just like a child of Abraham. We could also unite you with the pillars in Jerusalem, especially James, the brother of Jesus, the big new kahuna of the church. And if you want to be connected really well, then get connected to the book of James. We're going to make sure that this works for you. Now, uh, there's a problem here. One little schmeckle just made Jesus Christ worthless to you. Who knew? Who knew that you could void out Jesus. You can void a check. You understand that. You can even have a government that devalues your dollar. But is it possible to devalue Christ? Can Christ actually go void on you? Question. Isn't something free as long as I accept it? If I accept it, doesn't that make it by definition free? That would be not forced, but I take it upon myself freely. So I just want to add a little to my gospel portfolio and get the law up in here just a little bit. No, here is Jesus' math. Jesus' math works very differently than yours. Freedom plus the law does not equal more freedom. It equals less Jesus. One kosher dill and poof, not Christ himself is empty, but he is vain and vanished for your sake. Paul says, verse 3, I take the oath and I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. Luther says when he gets to this, Paul is on fire. Oh, we love it when Paul's on fire. Here in verse 3, he's not going to let anything go by. And he says, I take the oath. I testify. I put my hand on the Bible. I'm going to tell you now exactly what I mean by this whole matter of faith and justification by faith apart from works of the law. Paul is on fire. Can I go back, Paul? Can I take a little law? Can I do traditions at least since traditions make family? Can I get a little direction in my Christian life? Can I have a moral compass? Can I have a guide? Can I get a little discipline? Paul says, no. <laughs> you can't eat just one. There is no such thing as a little Torah. You can't order a plate of gospel and have a side of Torah. It doesn't work that way. You can't have a Torah sampler, even at Sam's Club, I understand. And in this way, now remember, Galatians actually now uh, have been misused commonly, especially by Protestants, who go back and say, well, you know, maybe what Paul is talking about is that you shouldn't adopt ritual law. Maybe you shouldn't uh, uh, take up the rituals of Jews. Maybe that was the problem. Maybe what really should happen is that you would take up the moral law. Get rid of the ritual. Take up the moral. Oh, but listen to this. Verse 5. But Paul is now going to tell you about the other side. That's not the way it works. The scissors, the snip, snip, you do a little bit and bye-bye forgiveness, bye-bye Hesed, bye-bye Emmet, step outside of Graceland with one toe and you have nothing but utter, complete, and total theory of God's eternal wrath, nothing else. So get ready for the way this is going to come raining down upon you. Then Paul says, but I'm not going to tell you something. We, by the Spirit, because of faith, await the hope of righteousness. You went back. We stayed. 
How did we stay? By the Spirit. Get ready. Most of you think Lutherans don't know a single thing about the Holy Spirit, but here you go. Uh, Not only are you going to hear it, but you're actually going to get it. When you get it, now you're going to see what it means to receive the Holy Spirit. Paul says he's got one big question in here. You heard it in the third chapter. He says, out of all of these uh, things that I have said to you, I want you to remember one thing. I will ask you a question. How did you get the Spirit? Did you get the Spirit by, by works according to the law? No, you didn't. You got it by baptism. So shut up. Sit down. I don't want to hear any more about this stuff, about how the Holy Spirit is moving, how the new fake preachers came in and they had a new revelation from Jesus Christ. I am getting rid of all of that. Then he tells us something very important here. He says, we await the hope of of righteousness. Now he uses a wonderful word. You've heard him use this word throughout uh, justified or faith. Faith justifies. So Paul has been talking about faith, 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 all the way up now to this chapter. Then suddenly he adds the word hope. When he adds the word hope, He now is going to tell you, and we give you a lesson on the relationship between faith and hope. People have never been able to figure out what the difference is. How do I know when I've got faith? How do I know when I've got hope? Well, Paul's going to tell you exactly what this is, and it's not two steps on a ladder. You don't start off with faith and then jump up to hope. That's not the way faith and hope work. How then do they work? Don't we have everything already when we have faith? Answer, yes, you have everything already. Well, what do we have then when we have faith? Well, you have the promise of Jesus Christ. When you have the promise of Jesus Christ, we ask, what does he promise? I forgive you. You've got it. You're not waiting for anything. You're not wondering if this might happen. You don't have uh, uh, hopes that it might happen, but you're not quite sure. So all of this faith means that you have this already. You have it fully and completely. But here's the problem. You have all of this by faith, but your feelings, your sensitivum, do not line up with faith. Feelings lag behind faith. You hear, you have, but you don't yet feel it. Now, get ready. I'm going to do a little mansplaining for you now. And when it comes to mansplaining, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what, uh, what uh, feelings are all about. Feelings are terrible. You should try to get rid of feelings as quickly as you possibly can. Most of you say, oh, go in and try to find your feeling inside and get it expressed outside. It will really help you. No, it doesn't help you. Uh, This particular problem of feelings is a constant problem. And of course, men are terrible at feelings. We all know this. Now we have an explanation. And you men can kindly finally figure out why you are actually here on earth uh, and what exactly is going on with this matter of what you do when you have feelings. Feelings are miserable, but listen to David, who is one of the worst at feelings that you can possibly find. Uh, It is Psalm 116, verse 120, a fabulous uh, psalm, and listen to this line. I kept on believing, even when I said I am completely crushed. There's your relationship between faith and feeling. His feelings were not running at the same level as his faith. And he says, I kept believing even when I felt completely crushed. That's hope. Faith stands in one place. Hope fights. Hope lets faith continue while it's under attack. Verse 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is valid, but faith active through love. My goodness, uh, you know, can't Paul just rest for a minute? Now he's going to add to faith and hope 
love. And you remember that these three become the great words that everybody talks about. Everybody thinks they understand them. This is why all of you use this for your wedding and completely mess it up. Faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Oh, yes, let's smooch and uh, move on. We've got, the, we've got the love going. Now Paul's going to tell you the relationship between faith and hope, and now he's going to teach love to you. All in two verses. So the first thing he's now going to tell you in, in order to understand what love is, is what love is not. Love is not circumcision. That's what Paul says. You don't have to go and get a mole uh, in order to love. Nor, uh, if you flip it over, nor is uncircumcision love. Hanging with the hoodies is also not going to give you the understanding of what true love means. This means love is not reward for doing the law. That's the first thing, what love is not. The second thing, by the way, this is one of the things I want on my tombstone. My tombstone is going to get very large. I've got a number of things that I want on there, but one of them is he was the doctor of love. Just remember this. Uh, and, uh, and I want you to learn not only what love is not, but what love really is. And uh, the first thing you have to understand is that it is faith that is active. Paul says this great line, faith is active through love. This is actually faith that is the active thing. Uh, well, active is a terrible word here. It sounds like a 55-plus community, legacy villages. Let's stay active, Mabel. Uh, that's not what Paul is talking about here. It, uh, the word is faith is efficacious. Faith is efficacious in love. That means with faith, love flows out. That means the same as milking a Holstein Frisian. You remember that great ad, Got Milk? I want to uh, bring this back uh, and uh, now apply it so that you understand how it is that love actually comes out of a person. Love is not a manual of dif discipline. With faith, love pours out automatically organically, like a mango tree. Paul is not saying, do this, love, love harder. Instead, he's saying faith has a promise in it. Hope holds on to that promise in the middle of trials. And then you know what happens? Love pours out while feelings wait to catch up to faith. And all three of these are going to be working at the same time. Love is not done by snipping the tip. Not by law. Law shows you that you don't love. How do you love then? You trust. But I don't feel it. I don't see it. No, Paul says this is a promise. I'm not giving you a command. I'm giving you a promise. You are a fountain. You are a machine of abundance. You are a great milk cow. Paul removes, at this point, all fake lovers and there are a lot of fake lovers out there. There is one type that we call the strivers after love who are always trying to find it and always trying to get it and think they are great at it. And then there are the loafers of love who don't try at all. They just sit on the couch and wait for you uh, to love them instead of they loving you. And instead now, Paul says, faith makes you into a milk cow of love. Twice a day you'll produce, and you'll have no idea where that milk goes. Nevertheless, it is going to supply many, many people. You were running well, Paul says, verse 7, who hindered you from obeying the truth? While your uh, spirit was standing, your old flesh was running well. The spirit stands. Your old flesh runs well. Uh, I can't go into a great deal of explanation, but fortunately this is available on 1517. You turn into Kelsey, and Kelsey's going to tell you what it's like to live outside yourself. This is uh, where we go at this particular point, and what it means to actually become a source of love when you yourself are not feeling it. 
you Lutherans went suddenly from being wallflowers to the world's greatest lovers. No one saw that coming. You are now a fountain of sexy joy. And Paul knows what went through you and how this actually worked. And he says, you were running well. This was going really, really well. And the love was pouring out of you. Verse 8, such seductive persuasion from the fake preachers, however, is not from him who calls you. Paul says, I know what happened to you running well. I know what happened to the love pouring out of you. You started listening to fake preachers. And when you listen to fake preachers, they were seductive persuaders. Who hindered you from being persuaded by the promise? A liar, Paul says. A liar. That is a seductive persuader. That is an American preacher. That's what got in your way. And once this happened, you went way off the rails. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. And Paul is the first one to say this, and it is not good. He means, well, here we are in Arkansas where all the apples had come from. Uh, that means that one bad apple spoils the whole bunch. That's what this means. And all it means is that you have one bad preacher and all of a sudden this is spreading like wildfire f uh, fire everywhere. But, verse 10, I will persuade you in the Lord so you have no other thing in mind and he who is troubling you will bear the judgment whatever that, whoever that is. But we know who that is. It's not just fake preachers, but fake preachers are sent by Satan himself. Satan is the one who opens this up. Satan is the one who is out to get this. And Satan knows exactly how to do this. Verse 11, but brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? If that is the case, the scandal of the cross has been removed. I love this. We often talk about the theology of the cross, rightly so. And we understand that if you're going to do the theology of the cross, you have to understand the scandal of the cross. And when you understand the scandal of the cross, then remember this. You can't skip the scandal of the cross and keep the cross. There are many people who are going to be talking about the cross and suffering and what it means to go through tough times, etc., etc., but you can't skip uh, the scandal of it. This is a condition contrary to fact. Fake news that Paul circumcised Timothy. Paul is saying here, it never happened. This story went out. People started thinking it. Poor old Luke actually wrote it down in the book of Acts because he thought it happened itself. Paul is telling you right here, it never happened, and I am correcting the record. If I taught circumcision, even as adiaphora, you could do it. You don't have to do it. You could enter into it. You don't have to enter into it and so on. Then the scandal of the... By the way, I mean, uh, we should uh, do an episode on Matthias Flatius Illyricus and understand something about the adiaphora controversy, which means what, what finally can you do and what do you have to avoid doing, especially when it comes to the matter of the liturgy? Well, Paul is saying right here, the scandal of the cross is this. Christ died on the cross, not to fulfill the law, but to end it. And that's a scandal. That's not just any scandal. It is the scandal of the cross. How do you try to de-scandalize the cross and still talk about the cross? What you do is you add the law to the cross. And when you do that, poof, the scandal of the cross is gone, and you have made the cross into nothing more than a business transaction, and that is not what Jesus Christ is doing on the cross. Verse 12, I wish that you would just cut off the whole thing that is stirring you up. Fake preachers are everywhere. If they seduce you into one law, I prefer that you would cut the whole thing off. 
no snip and tuck. You are better off going full bobbit uh, than to carry on in this particular manner. And I don't want any more, Paul says, verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brethren. This is not an occasion for the flesh. The opposite. Through love, be a slave to another. Now we're going to learn both uh, about faith and love, faith, hope, and love. We're also going to learn one of these other great uh, distinctions, the distinction between spirit and faith flesh. And when we do that, uh, Paul now says the whole law is, uh, ends up in this one word, love your neighbor as yourself. Shall I summarize the law, Paul says. I'll give you the Reader's Digest version. It comes from Luke, or excuse me, from Leviticus 19, 18, love. That's it. That's the whole law. And if you run around saying, well, I don't know what the law is, I'm not exactly sure, that. maybe I can take part of the law and uh, whatever it might be, all of this comes down to this love. But when you snip and you snap, you devour one another, be careful that you don't each o- eat each other alive. And that is a great description of what it is like to be in a church. Practicing holiness, they don't just nibble, they eat each other alive. Verse 16, but unlike the fake preachers, I say, Paul says, walk by the Spirit and not to fulfill the willful passions of the flesh. Now, of course, I I wish I had more time, but here I will give this much to you. The Holy Spirit has a way of walking. You will learn what the Holy Spirit's walk is. It is a Holy Spirit strut. It is not strutting according to the law. That is not the Holy Spirit walk. That is a perp walk. Nor is it a pimp walk, although I do like the hip action and the cane in that particular matter. But the Holy Spirit walk is head up. It is confidence. It says, I am free. I am forgiven. Don't look down at the fleshly members, but your feet are always on the ground. Then Paul says, look, if you want full lists of all of these things, I'll give them to you. You know the works of the flesh, fornication, sexual immorality that smells like a dead fish head. (laughs) That's a literal translation. Licentiousness, idolatry, witchcraft, all of this. But I preach to you as I preached before that those who practice the law shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But listen, the fruit of the Spirit is joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, humility. Of these things there is no law. What makes them happen then? Faith. And faith holds on to the promise of Christ even in the midst of trial and difficulty and it hopes in the middle of that and it trusts that love is being poured out of you. So we do not Uh, So, uh, when we live by the Spirit, let us be conscripted up into the ranks, walking behind the Holy Spirit in the Holy Spirit walk, which is not under the law, but it is entirely and completely according to this promise. Jesus Christ died once and for all so that your sins would be forgiven. And I can tell you, I forgive your sins here and now. And when you've got that, you've got everything. Amen.